Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, and we're going to highlight a nice feature story from the current issue that's out on the stands right now. This is a um, big naval story that has received scant attention, oddly enough. I'm talking of the largest, longest naval blockade in modern history, the Siege of Wonsan during the Korean War. Uh, this was a game changer in that war, and it surprisingly received uh, little coverage. I think probably because it was um, not resolved till 1953, and it ran all the way to 1953. It was an epic, epic naval blockade. And here to talk about his article about this is prolific historian and frequent guest, Edward J. Marauda. Ed, welcome back. Great to see you again. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure being with you this morning. Yes, indeed. Um, and this is such a great story. Uh, it's always fun um, dabbling in history because you, you there's so much to know and there's always something more to know. And mm -hmm. one might feel like they're fairly well versed in uh, the history of the Korean War, but this is something that even if you, you've heard of it, you probably maybe didn't realize the magnitude of it, but this was a, certainly a large scale operation. So why don't you uh, set the table for us and we'll talk about the epic siege of Wonsan. Well, it's sort of an anomaly because uh, if anyone has followed the Korean War and the U.S. Navy in the Korean War, then one knows about uh, Navy and Marine Corps, uh, the famous landing at Incheon for the 1st Marine Division and the Army 7th Infantry Division, and also the fight to hold the uh, perimeter of South Vietnam at the Denton Tong River, and uh, the October-November intervention by the People's Republic of China and its armed forces uh, the famous Marine withdrawal, fighting in another direction from Chosen Reservoir, Changjin Reservoir. And all, all those events occurred in 1950. And after 1950, the fighting pretty much stabilized along the 38th parallel, the demilitarized zone, which later became demilitarized zone between uh, North Korea and South Korea. So from 19, January of 1951 on, uh, there wasn't a lot of movement in Korea. It was basically uh, the f fighting front stabilized, and uh, and that's it. Now, the official history, James F Field did the U.S. Navy's official history of the Korean War, and he gives a lot of attention to the events of 1950. And I don't want to say it's an afterthought, but not as much attention to the period afterward, which is you know, January of 51 till July of 1953. And uh, but there was a lot happening, and that's what uh, the siege of Wonsan actually we talk about. That um, unprecedented, really, in modern times, how naval force had been applied applied to support the ground campaign of the United Nations forces fighting there. And um, this was something that uh, what do you do if the the fighting front has stabilized? What does the navy do? There's no fleet out there to sink. Uh, number one, we had chased the North Korean Navy out of the waters of the Sea of Japan uh, early in the war, in fact, the first month or two. And we had almost complete air dominance over eastern North Korea from that point out. So we had air and sea superiority in the region. What do you do with your fleet? You going to sit out there and, uh, you know, do circles in the water? No, you employ naval power to assist the ground campaign. And that's what the siege of Wonsan really was all about. Well, they couldn't have picked a more apt target for a siege and a blockade. Uh, the east coast port of Wonsan was uh, vastly important to North Korea, was it not? It's uh, protected by the typhoons from the outlying islands. It um, mm -hmm. doesn't freeze up in the winter. It was a major, major entry and exit point, point for the nation and um, to block that off is going to seriously choke their war effort and just their infrastructure. So you can oh, see why it was a good target. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it was a major industrial and economic facility as well, Wonsan, the city, of maybe 100,000 uh, civilians before the war. And it was the, uh, the exit point and entry point for the railroads coming from Pyongyang to the west, uh, from the border of the Soviet Union to the north, and of course, to the south was to the 38th parallel. So all those road and rail connections came together that Wonsan. 
uh, in addition to that, you had major industrial facilities. You had a metals plant. You had a petroleum oil and refinery there. You had an airfield and major uh, barracks for troops and major place for uh, the military forces of North Korea and even the Chinese army to, uh, to hold. Very critical point in their logistical infrastructure on the East Coast. It was also the center of a robust fishing industry before the war. Many fishing boats left from Wonsan came back with their catches. And of course, the food from that catch helped the, the enemy forces, helped sustain them during the war. So that became a critical a military objective to cut off this food supply. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll go over all the different aspects of this siege. But one of the challenges it faced was they had they mined the hell out of that harbor, did they not? <laughs> uh, absolutely. In fact, it was a big problem the previous year in 1950 when uh, after Incheon, uh, the United Nations Command, General MacArthur and company, uh, decided, well, Incheon worked so well, let's go to the other ocean, uh, the other sea, and do another amphibious landing. Well, they, the 1st Marine Division with the, Na the Navy 7th Fleet um, pulled up to Wonsan and said, okay, now we're going to go ashore. Well, you couldn't go ashore because uh, the Soviets had provided all kinds of ocean mines uh, to the North Koreans, and they seeded the harbor with all these mines. Um, as we tried to go in there with our minesweepers, some were sunk. The Pledge, um, other other minesweeping vessels of the U.S. Navy and the Republic of Korean Navy uh, were sunk with great loss of life. So it, uh, and of even greater importance, it, it denied the ability of the 1st Marine Division to come ashore and launch their offensive up into a northeastern Korea. They they call that Operation Yo-Yo because the ships were just going in, in circles waiting to land. They finally did go to shore and, of course, moved up to Chosin Reservoir and elsewhere. But it was a big problem, and the mines were still a problem in January 1951. So the, one of the first tasks was we've got to make sure that, that we've cleared lanes to the port, in, into the harbor, and because the enemy had reseeded, if you will, uh, those m mine lanes that had been cleared previously in, in 1950. So 51, January 51, uh, Adm Rear Admiral Hope Smith, Alan E. Hope Smith, uh, head of Task Force 95, the escort and uh, bombardment force, um, that was his first task. We have to clear the mines from the, the lanes that would give us access to the harbor. And so that was done over a period of time. Well, you can't send minesweepers into these areas without protection. They were pretty much unarmed, the minesweeping vessels, very small arms on board. And uh, so destroyers had to go in with them. And this was also tied into a larger strategic objective that um, since the front was stabilizing, the UN command said, well, we need to prepare for the possibility that we will launch another offensive, even though we had withdrawn 100,000 troops, including the 1st Marine Division and South Vietnamese and, and U.S. troops uh, from Northeast uh, Korea uh, after the Chosin Reservoir battle, uh, the thought was we, we might be going back in to launch another counteroffensive. So Wonsan would become an important point from which to launch that counteroffensive. And uh, this was on both coasts. They were thinking about using both coasts to enter U.S. and U.N. forces. But it increasingly became obvious that uh, that maybe that's the long-term objective. But in the short term, uh, Wonsan could be very effective for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, if we invested it with, uh, with the blockading forces, we could prevent its use as a fishing industry. We could prevent its... Uh, give trouble to the enemy using the road and rail connections. Um, and more than that, because the North Koreans and especially the Chinese were always afraid of another Incheon happening. I mean, they were surprised, unpleasantly surprised in, in September of 1950. They did not want to have that happen again. So they kept out some 60,000 to 80,000 troops Behind the front lines, those troops could have been used on the DM, or on the 38th parallel, uh, but they held them back for fear of another amphibious landing. 
so this was a good use of naval force to, as a deterrent, if you will, to threaten a future landing. Yes, definitely. Um, that that phobia of a uh, repeat of Inchon on mm -hmm. the eastern coast of the country um, haunted them the whole time our um, fleet was deployed off uh, off that harbor. Uh, they, they kept thinking it was coming. And um, yeah, there's a great sort of secondary um, aspect of the strategy is um, you're going to tie mm -hmm. up their troops because they're, you know, you got them on the defensive mentally right. in this case. Um, so the minesweepers... Uh, had a huge, you know, the, the mine uh, collecting boats had a huge part of this uh, early on. But another star of this show, if you will, were the um, good old battleships because um, they just pummeled uh, the living daylights out of that harbor all the way to 53. And um, I'm sure it would, if if you were an earplug salesman in Wonsan in the early <laughs> 50s, you were probably making a killing. <laughs> But those were the old battle wagons really came back to the forefront in this uh, blockade, did they not? Well, I, I would like, I absolutely agree, but I want to credit more than the battleships, but also the cruisers, the heavy cruisers, the light cruisers, and the destroyer force, and the rocket, we had rocket ships. Um, you see, even in Ukraine today, the Russians and the Ukrainians are using multiple launch rocket systems. Mm -hmm. um, they've had those in the inventory since World War II. And we had them during Korea. They could put out 5,000 rounds in a few a few minutes. Uh, very effective, multiple, you know, rocket activity against the enemy's forces when the enemy forces mass uh, and you catch them in that, that situation. But the, uh, yeah, the eight inch gun cruisers, the six inch gun cruisers, and certainly the 16 inch battleships, the Iowa class battleships, Iowa, Missouri, New Jersey and Wisconsin, right. uh, they all took part in the, the fighting there in, in Korea. And um, they had a number of capabilities. Number one, you put out a lot of firepower and they had great range, I think 17 miles or, or greater. And uh, whenever they entered the harbor, uh, quite often North Vietnamese uh, counter battery, the batteries ashore would not open fire because they knew what would happen if they did. Um, the other factor was their armor, their heavy protective armor uh, that allowed them, the ships, to operate in, in the harbor with very limited fear of enemy mines. I mean, they would, you know, bounce off the hull, if you will. And even the gunfire from the uh, communist uh, coastal batteries, which were mostly field artillery pieces. These are not big coastal guns that uh, you might, might remember from World War II. Uh, these were artillery pieces, and their projectiles could certainly kill sailors and did on you know on numerous occasions, but very hard to penetrate a battleship's armor. And uh, those battleships, as we know, lived on to do the same sort of thing in the Persian Gulf War, 1991. Uh, Missouri and uh, Wisconsin both operated up close and personal in Kuwait because we were not concerned so much about mines being a threat to them. And they, their firepower, again, was very critical. Yeah, you mentioned the um, Desert Storm. Uh, for our anniversary um, cover story about that, uh, we used a painting of Missouri, still in the, th still in the mm -hmm. fight in the early mm -hmm. 90s. Just something wonderful to see about that. Well, in addition to choking off the harbor, they also, they also wanted to cut off the this major city from the land routes to the rest of the country. That was a mission as well, correct? Uh, absolutely. And the, uh, you know, the gunfire from the naval warships was, was critical to that. But another factor was the support for the air effort, the United Nations air effort, bombing targets. And because behind Wonsan were the Tybeck Mountains, the enemy could have uh, tunnels through the mountains for their railroads where they they would keep the, the locomotives and the boxcars until it was clear. Well, quite often the Navy could provide illumination rounds for the aircraft who were doing the bombing behind the mountains, if you will, and uh, other support that, uh, that helped them to carry out their air support mission. And both the, the naval gunfire, which not only took out most of Wonsan by the end of, of the war, but also the coastal traffic. The North Koreans employed junks and sampans to bring supplies 
from Northeast Korea and tried to get it down to the 38th parallel area. Uh, we took out hundreds of those junks and sampans. Uh, <laughs> jumping ahead almost, we look at Vietnam, the same sort of thing, stopping infiltration of uh, the North Vietnamese uh, infiltrating force. Same thing in Korea. So the Sea of Japan was really denied to the enemy. That is a major factor uh, in the, the campaign. Another important thing I think to point out here is that um, you had contributions from countries all over the world to the UN effort in Korea, the first post-World War II effort to stop aggression. So you had a lot of support. And these countries that provided ships, they said, well, we want to do something worthwhile out here. We don't just want to steam around. So the Siege of Wonsan allowed the Royal Navy and the navies of Canada, Australia, Colombia had ships there. Uh, they all wanted to do something worthwhile. And this was a worthwhile naval effort to actually support the ground campaign. Perfect opportunity for an international um, coordinated effort. Um, mm -hmm. And that, of course, was the uh, overarching uh, theme of this conflict from the get-go. It was going to be an international coalition stopping the spread. Um, very much so that. You mentioned how uh, the Sea of Japan was denied. That's an important overall naval factor to this war, isn't it? I mean, the North Korean Navy was pretty much shut out of the game by early on. Well, they, what, they're they one of the first operations on the 25th of uh, June, 1950. They sent a ship with uh, troops on board to take the port of Pusan in South Korea. Well, that ship was intercepted and sunk. And shortly afterward, U.S. and British warships sank a number of other North Korean naval vessels caught offshore in the Sea of Japan, which, by the way, is referred to as the East Sea by the Koreans, mm -hmm. um, not wanting the connection with Japan. But anyway, so the North Korean Navy was not a factor. And as I mentioned earlier, North, North Korean and Chinese air, air availability was not as great on the East Coast. I mean, this is far from the Yalu, and they'd have to cross against uh, North Korea and against uh, allied air power. So air and naval power on the, the enemy side was not a factor of great, but they had a lot of forces ashore with guns and they shot and uh, we lost we lost we lost minesweepers as I mentioned to the mines. We had numerous sailors killed from enemy gunfire. Um, we had turret explosions. In fact, uh, we had a cruiser with that lost 30 sailors to a turret explosion. Um, an ongoing problem, you know, in all the wars, these things, sometimes uh, the equipment goes awry and sailors die. Um, and it was not uh, not an easy duty. I mean, not only the fit you're in this harbor. In fact, one observer said that the once on siege was almost like fighting in the Chesapeake Bay. The enemy's all around. All the shores are covered by the enemy. And uh, so that was a concern. And uh, And it was sometimes boring duty, nothing would happen, nobody would fire, they'd just be steaming around. But for, you know, a year, two and a half years, this was the job, they had to do it. Now, there were other pluses to the uh, possession of the harbor at Wonsan, and that was, it gave, it gave the UN forces the ability to uh, put saboteurs ashore, to blow up enemy rain, train tracks, uh, to weft enemy barracks, and all kinds of things to gather intelligence on the enemy's forces ashore. Uh, this was done throughout. One of the uh, favorite things of the some of the destroyers was to put their whale boat in the, in the water and bring intelligence agents ashore back and forth. Another tactic was to seize a North Korean fishing vessels. Mm -hmm. And they would talk to the fishermen who were <laughs> amazingly open to, to give intelligence about the enemy's forces ashore. They're just fishermen. They said, you asked a question? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. There's This unit's over there. That unit's over there. You know, Give me some food, and I'll go back to the shore and continue my fishing. Uh, so that so gathering intelligence was important. Landing saboteurs and just making life very difficult for the enemy was the primary objective. Yeah, that was one of those interesting sort of side stories within this larger story was the secreting of the spies to shore amid all the Sturm and Drang of this massive <laughs> blockade that's going on. Right. That's just really neat stuff. And um, a, a golden opportunity not missed. Um, mm -hmm. 
Well, let's get uh, contrafactual here just for fun a little bit. Um, how would the course of the Korean War have perhaps been different had we not laid siege to the major port city of Wonsan for two and a half years? Well, it's a, a counterfactual, as you said. I mean, it's a guessing game, but it would have it would have enabled the enemy to have a major port, major port in industrial and economic facility functioning, to, and able to support the battlefront at the 38th parallel. Um, if we didn't have the navy out there and the threat of an amphibious landing at some point, you would have had all those troops that would have bolstered the defenses at the 30th parallel, the enemy's defenses, uh, we lost a lot of people along that uh, battlefront. And uh, so it would have made life doubly difficult for them. And uh, this was a, I think it helped bring about the end of the war because along with the bombing, which flattened a lot of North Korea by 1953, uh, this was part of it to say, you know, th you're carrying on this war. How long do you want to do it? You're suffering badly. Your people are suffering, and the Soviet Union will say, "All right, enough is already." You know, you've made your point, Mao, Mao Zedong. Uh, you have kept the Americans. You pushed the Americans back from the Yalu River, and uh, you showed them that the People's Republic of China has stood up, if you will. You made your point, okay? But now you're not doing anything. You launched counteroffensives in late 1950, early 51, that uh, got a lot of Chinese soldiers killed. You made marginal advances, and now you're stuck on the 38th parallel. Do you want to continue this forever? So both the Soviets and the Chinese were saying enough is enough to the North Koreans. North Koreans were saying basically the same thing. We're pretty beat up here, and we've made our point. We, st we now continue to exist. Uh, so, that, uh, so it helped bring about the end of the, of the conflict. Yeah, indeed. It's hard to imagine them being brought to the negotiating table as soon as they were, relatively speaking, had that port still been open, um, that just they're, they're feeding their people, their their troops are freed up, their mm -hmm. their in, industrial infrastructure there is un, unhindered. Um, it's hard to imagine it wouldn't have gone on longer, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, what about the uh, other parallels in history to a blockade of this scope? Can you? Um, Think of any off the top of your head that are the same sort of thing, where it's a large-scale, long-term, uh, very serious and um, unyielding naval blockade that eventually just makes the other side cry uncle. Um, it's well, a, I, uh, looking back in history, of course, there are, are, are blockades of sort. Um, certainly World War I, you had the, the mine barrage in the, in the Baltic that... Um, was intended to stop the German high seas fleet from coming out. Um, Germany was suffering very badly by the end of World War I because their foodstuffs were really dwindling. And part of that was the Allied naval blockade. Um, and he, going back to the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy uh, put a real hurt on the French with their blockade of French ports uh, throughout the conflict. Uh, so even uh, looking at... Um, the Vietnam War, I've done a little bit of work on the Vietnam War and the, uh, the U.S. Navy's market time patrol, anti-infiltration patrol. Um, we really, um, we kept the North, uh, the North Vietnamese from uh, supplying their forces in South Vietnam along because of the market time patrol. Um, now, there, I should add a caveat here, though. The enemy found a workaround. That was the port of Sihanoukville in supposedly neutral Cambodia. Chinese ships, North Korean, sh North Vietnamese ships would unload materials there, which then found their way into South Vietnam. So market time was partially successful. But um, it was successful on the coast of South Vietnam and really limiting what the enemy could deliver to the Viet Cong forces there. Yeah. And seeking for historical parallels, I, my mind initially went to uh, the Civil War and the blockade of the South. Oh, yeah, absolutely right. It actually choked the living daylights out of them. But I, I feel like that's sort of an inexact parallel to this because this is a massive blockade of one single port of entry, whereas, you know, something like the Anaconda Plan is the entire Confederate mm -hmm. coast. So, yes, they're both block blockades, but the similarity is sort of ends there. Um, well, I, I can add to that that – 
it wasn't just Wonsan that was that was blockaded. The entire coast of Northeast Korea, uh, their smaller ports that mm -hmm. were uh, invested as well. They could, they can do, couldn't do much in those ports by way of economic activity. Right. And of course, we were hitting the rail lines all the way to the Soviet border uh, that passed through these these minor ports. So they were all invested as well as Wonsan. So really, the uh, Sea of Japan, from the enemy standpoint, was closed off to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly like the that that equates to the Anaconda plan if you s spread the map out that way. Yes, for sure. Well, I feel like. It's not quite as exciting and dazzling as uh, the study of battles and campaigns, but it's such a key part of naval strategy, isn't it? Uh, the art of the blockade. Um, that's kind Absolutely. of that's the big determinant in so many things. I think uh, historians have argued, and I would agree, that uh, naval warfare can usually not be decisive against a continental power or a peninsular power but it can certainly enable the ground forces to, to do that, to carry through and, and win the conflict. Um, a very critical naval use of power. And what would happen if uh, the navies just sat out there and did nothing to support the war effort? After a while, uh, their governments will say, why do we need ships? What, what's the use of a navy if they're not doing anything? So they were put to po you know positive use in, in the Korean War. Another thing I want to point out, too, the first there are a few innovations that uh, occurred during the siege of Wonsan, and that was the use of helicopters. Okay, We had Sikorsky helicopters, very basic helicopters, that were first put on vessels and then ashore at one of the islands in the harbor, and they were used to spot mines. Okay, You're in the water, you see a mine, either somebody on the helicopter or somebody on a ship nearby can then uh, shoot the mine and, and take it out or somehow and retrieve the mines and get them out of harm's way. And then it became clear, well, you know, we can we can uh, use those for spotting mines and spotting artillery fire and the rest of it, naval gunfire. Why not use them to rescue aviators who go down in the waters off North Korea or even ashore? And this was uh, hadn't really been done in any significant way beforehand, but they we started to do that, basing helicopters there, uh, I think it was Helicopter Support Squadron 1, um, would go ashore to get uh, downed flyers. One in particular, John Kolsch, who later received the Medal of Honor for his bravery uh, in action ashore, but also in, in prison camp. He died there. But before that, uh, he was involved in picking up aviators who went down in the, 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 the harbor of Wonsan. And, you know, the thing is, this blockade enabled... UN forces to be very cl up close to the China, to the North Korean coastline, so the pilots had all they could do to get back out to water before they could bail out. So it became a ready place for aviators to come down. Uh, another um, famous sailor, he later served in Vietnam and head of the River Patrol Force, Paul Gray. Paul Gray was the commanding officer of Fighter Squadron 54, I believe it is. Uh, he had the distinction of being retrieved from the harbor waters three times during the Korean War. Be very thankful for the helicopters uh, doing that duty. So that was uh, that was, was critical. That's excellent. That's an excellent innovation uh, in the thick of wartime. Okay, one last thing uh, in the food for thought department. <laughs> um, let's look at the current geopolitical situation. Where in the hot spots, the potential hot spots of the of the globe today, can you envision a future war scenario where such a blockade of this would be um, especially applicable? Well, I can think of uh, two analogies or two spots that, that come to mind. First is the Black Sea. Uh, we're watching every day the, uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Russia, they had a deal, Turkey worked out a deal where both Ukraine and Russia could export uh, their grain products to the world, the hungry world. Well, for various reasons, uh, Putin has closed off, ended that deal, and start, he started attacking Odessa and other ports, Mykolaiv, where the Ukrainians were shipping their, their uh, foodstuffs out. 
And uh, recently, the Ukrainians have responded. They have gone after some of the naval vessels. They sank the Moskva uh, not too long ago, uh, the command ship of the, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. And, and the other day, they put a, a torpedo, not a torpedo, but a, a remotely piloted boat with explosives into the hull of a uh, another vessel, which you could see it very clearly listing the port as they're towing out of there, it, it was damaged. So both sides are going after each other's warships and after each other's uh, uh, commercial vessels as well. I don't know where this is gonna go, but this could be an all out uh, war, naval war in the Black Sea with all kinds of untold consequences to both sides. Uh, very interesting. Uh, they both need access to the sea obviously, for their economic well-being and their military well-being. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind is Taiwan. Uh, if, it, if it would be at all possible to blockade China, of course, that's an act of war. And uh, I think a lot of folks don't want World War III with uh, China and the United States. Uh, not only would it be difficult to employ, but uh, as I mentioned, has all all kinds of untold consequences. Um, another analogy to uh, the same sort of thing, if you look at World War II, uh, the use of mine warfare and submarine warfare to cut off the movement of the enemy for the Japanese forces. First of all, at the end of the war, you had some 1 million Japanese troops in China who could not get back to Japan to help defend the homeland because they had no vessels left. Uh, the U.S. submarine force had taken out three-fourths of the merchant marine of Japan. Uh, that's that's a long-distance blockade, but it's a blockade nonetheless. And the, and the use of mines. Now, the Navy doesn't like to point this out, but the, U, the Army Air Force put thousands and thousands of mines in the waters all around Japan and the Western Pacific, which put a real crimp on the enemy's movement of naval vessels and merchant ships. Uh, so those are distant blockades, but uh, they can be very effective. Yes, indeed. So I don't think the world has seen the last of the naval blockade. Um, who knows what the future holds in store, but there are any number of scenarios one can imagine where a blockade would be the appropriate measure. Right. Well, this has been a... Um, Great discussion, Ed, and it was a great feature article. I highly recommend it to everybody. It's currently out in the current issue of Naval History Magazine, and um, it is one of the highlights of this issue. And if you haven't read it yet, I recommend that you do. And I'd like to thank you, Ed, for joining us again on the podcast. And I'm sure we'll have you back because I envision uh, future great offerings from you in the magazine as well. As always, it's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Ed. Same here. Well, that's it for this time, folks. Until next time, I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, signing off.